Our first story today comes from the Washington Examiner by Andrew Mark Miller. And this is actually from May 21st. We are going back in time here almost two months. And this is like, we missed this story. And this was in black and white right in front of us the whole time. Doctors in Northern California say they have seen more deaths from suicide than they've seen from the coronavirus, or sorry, more deaths from suicide than they've seen from the coronavirus during the pandemic. As Dr. Michael de Bois Blanc of John Muir Medical Center in Walnut Creek, California said, the numbers are unprecedented. He's seen a year's worth of suicide in the last four weeks alone. Personally, I think it's time. I think originally this was put in place to flatten the curve and to make sure hospitals have the resources to take care of COVID patients. We have the current resources to do that, and our other community health is suffering. Casey Hansen at Trauma Center News said John Muir Medical Center for more than 30 years says she's not worried only, she's worried not only about the increased suicide attempts, but also about the hospital's ability to save as many patients as usual. As she said, <clears throat> What I have seen recently, I have never seen so much intentional injury. Businesses across California have started defying stay-at-home orders imposed by Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom and hundreds of protesters have hit the streets, making the argument that the orders were only meant to flatten the curve of the virus's spread, which Newsom himself said was achieved in mid-April. Suicide has been an increasingly significant problem across the country as the coronavirus outbreak caused stay-at-home orders that led to unemployment and stress. By late March, more people had died in just one Tennessee county from suicide than had died in the entire state directly from the virus. A study published in early May suggested that the coronavirus could lead to at least 75,000 deaths directly brought on by anxiety from the virus, job losses, and addiction to alcohol and drugs. Another study conducted by Just Facts Around the same time, computed a broad array of scientific data showing that stress is the deadliest health has one of the deadliest health hazards in the world, and estimated that the coronavirus lockdowns will destroy seven times as many years of human life than strict lockdowns can save. <clears throat> now we've heard of like the, the letters from doctors, right? Anytime you get uh, you know, a couple hundred doctors to agree on something, you can get them to sign a letter, and then politicians and pundits like me can say, "Oh, look." Hundreds of doctors agree. The doctor, the science is settled. The doctors agree with me on this one. Look, I can find doctors to, to back up my pre uh, preconceived biases and, and assumptions about anything. And especially now, that's very dangerous. And here, you know, this is the, the earlier this week. So this is, and again, this is in May. This is this is the one you didn't hear about, right? This is the um, um, just one measure, one indicator of the politicization of science today in America. Earlier this week, more than 600 doctors signed their names on a letter to President Trump referring to the continued lockdowns as a mass, ca mass casualty incident and urging him to do what he can ensure they come to an end. That's right. It, you know, I, I've been referring to this as the, you know, forced unemployment crisis, right? I think that's still the best, you know, sort of measure and, and, and describer of, the economic crisis that we're experiencing right now. But these doctors are, well, now we can call it a mass casualty incident. And, you know, I, I think about how did this come about? Like how, because I, I and, and this is where, you know, I mean, I hate to say, I told you, we're going to get more statistics from this. It's going to get worse. You are going to see more suicides as a result of the economic shutdown than from the virus itself. But right now, you can't even pull this out of the statistics. We have to rely on this kind of anecdotal analysis, at least for now. And this is what they're doing. Again, the basic big lie about the corona statistics is that they are misattributing death. A lot of people aren't dying. Is it someone comes in and, and and has killed themselves, like in this hospital, right? Who's dying from suicide. And because they test positive for coronavirus, they're going to say they died with coronavirus. 
somehow in the reshuffling of statistics that becomes a coronavirus death and then the media can report it as di- oh, coronavirus death that means they died from coronavirus right but think about the politicians and making this decision to declare a state of emergency right you, you think about you know, Donald Trump when, when he was saying hey this is when he, when he was right to begin with on the virus saying this is no big deal we can handle this we've, we've handled worse we've handled crazier stuff and you know it's it's it, he compared it to the flu and it was a very uh, appropriate comparison that uh, he's been lampooned uh, for but I think it's part of just him being bullied into the trap of declaring a state of emergency and you think about like even even Gavin Newsom right he's in this position where all of his experts are coming to him all of his advisors Trump just declared a national state of emergency and the governor of California Gavin Newsom who I just found out yesterday happens to be the nephew of speaker Nancy Pelosi yeah I uh, he looks at this from a political lens and you go, what, why, why is it important for me as a libertarian? You know, you need to look at this from, from a free market perspective. You need to look at this from a, 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 a lens of uh, free trade and, and, and uh, you know, and, and options, right? Giving people the choice as consumers. Well, they don't have a choice when it comes to government, right? You can't say, well, you know what, I'm just going to opt out of the American government and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, align with some other government on my land. I'm going to be a citizen of a different country now, or I'm going to secede like we're doing here in Gardenia, right? Well, when Gavin Newsom makes that decision, the difference between him and someone who, who's acting peacefully, right, to provoke, I mean, when Gavin Newsom, when the governor of California says, oh, there's a problem, I need to apply a solution, their solution is going to inherently be violent. It's inherently coercive because it's being done by government. You might say, well, they're just giving away money. If that's the case, they're just giving away money. Well, how did they get that money in the first place? They stole it from the people. There's, there's no way around it. Because they, even if what they're doing right now is in and of itself not coercive, there's, there's violence behind it. And more importantly than the violence or lack of violence in the act itself that the government is taking to propose uh, a solution to a problem is the lack of accountability. And so... I, I'm reminded of the Thomas Sowell quote. It is hard to imagine a more stupid or more dangerous way of making decisions than by putting those decisions in the hands of people who pay no price for being wrong. If Gavin Newsom's orders do more harm than good, all he has to do is convince people to reelect him and he faces no accountability at all. All he has to do is keep this lie going that, oh no, the, the, the cure is not worse than the disease. I mean, yeah, there are more people committing suicide than ever before, but think of how many more would have died with the virus. And these excuses are wearing thin now, as it says in the story, even the doctors are going, hey, flatten the curve, we flatten the curve. In Arizona right now, where people are freaking out, oh, this is the biggest hotspot. What were we freaking out about two or three months ago? Well, we, we might not flatten the curve, and we might have hospitals overwhelmed in ICU beds, intensive care unit capacity, not able to handle the influx of patients. Well, oh my gosh, in Arizona, we only have... That we're 17 ICU beds free. This statistic doesn't mean much to me, but it, it, we're not overloaded. And this is the worst it's ever been. The worst, worst it could possibly be. No, it could get worse. Eh, not, not really. Once you say, you know, this, this excuse kind of wears out, right? Eventually we get to herd immunity or a vaccine or whatever else it is that, that stabilizes our relationship with the virus itself, but that doesn't stop the real problem of the suicides now. And as the the quote in that article says, like they're they're not able to take care of this now suicide epidemic. It's scary to think that we can't even keep track 
accurately. We don't. And it's not that we can't. It's that we have we have a government that actively impedes our ability to understand the world, to just compile accurate statistics. If the people making these decisions face responsibility or any kind of accountability for being wrong in making those decisions, there's a different kind of decision-making process that they go through. If someone had been in that room with Gavin Newsom and said, excuse me, but Governor, Governor, by the way, if, if suicides go up during it, 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 the unintended consequences of this policy are worse than you can convince the voters that the virus would have been, you're going to be, you're going to be, you're going to be out of a job. And because of this new California law that doesn't exist, I'm just saying this hypothetically, right? Oh, but you could get sued for that. Well, then, then Gavin Newsom is going to go, hmm. Well, how bad could it? Let's take appropriate precautions. Let's minimize that unintended consequence. But no. So let's let's go back, uh, go forward in time, rather. Let's go back to the future, back to the present, almost here, with an article from today's LA Times from Yahoo.com. Californians turn on each other as coronavirus shuts down the state for a second time. Dee Lesko had the bad news from her landlord, her Costa Mesa hair salon had reopened on June 1st after being dark for months because of the COVID-19 pandemic dealing a painful economic blow to the 66-year-old stylist. And now coronavirus shut down 2.0. As Lesko tweeted in a rush of anger, is it asking too much to wear a mask? You can't have a healthy economy. Without a healthy community, get a clue, please. Now, this is a you know, really disgusting kind of victim blaming. But this is exactly how we have been turned on each other right now, right? If the government shuts down California again, right, like they're, or like they're doing, and says, well, it's because the people didn't wear masks. Yeah, because 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 you weren't obedient and compliant enough. We're going to have to shut you down even harder again. And it's like and then the, the people who are affected by this in the community, like the owner of a hair salon. Instead of blaming government, blames the people who are the victim of government. No, vi victim blaming really is uh, a disgusting phenomenon. And it is. Primarily used, obviously, to deflect blame from those who are truly responsible, right? And, and the, the, the traditional, you know, archetype victim blaming is, oh, you got raped? Well, it was because you were wearing provocative clothing walking down the street. <clears throat> hmm. No, uh, it's because there was a rapist there who raped you. Don't blame the victim. And it's the same thing with this, and it is disgusting. I, I mean, I can't say it enough, like, no, the, the people are the victims here, and they've been lying. And, and but you know what? Even even deep. See now, I'm I'm engaging in a kind of victim blaming myself right here because I'm I'm blaming D, and it's like she's she's turning on her fellow Californians. But why? Because she's been lied to. She's a victim too. At least she said, "Please." Social media exploded this week with furious, often expletive laced outbursts after Gavin Newsom announced Monday that California must largely close her business yet again because of a spike in COVID-19 cases statewide that shows no sign of easing. On Tuesday, the state reported its largest one-day total of new cases, along with sharp jumps in hospitalizations and deaths. Now, how many of those are suicides being tallied as corona deaths? You think things changed since May? Since, since that other article where doctors were already realizing that there were more suicides than coronavirus deaths. Over the course of the four-month pandemic, Californians have focused their anger at the governor and other politicians, county health officials, and the current resident of the White House. But now, in the early days of yet another shutdown, they are turning on each other like never before. Because when it comes to the coronavirus, we have met the enemy, and he is us. The first shutdown was bad enough, throwing millions of workers out of jobs. 
canceling graduations and in-person June weddings and forcing families to bury loved ones without the solace of funeral services and the comforting embrace of supportive friends. Then George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis, unleashing a nationwide flood of fury aimed at police brutality and systemic racism. Now, when it comes to this, you know, look at the police. A lot of us as libertarians who understand that, that police are the enforcement arm of, of the government. That, that you know, when, when they say all cops are bastards, you, you can you can really you can justify that. Uh, now, does that mean individual personality or bastard? No, but if you're one of the you know cops who thinks that you're a good cop, well, you've been bastardized to support a system that protects bad cops. But then you think about like you know, I. I I, mean, I got to reference Kyle Kinane, one of my favorite stand-up comedians, saying, you know what, I, I know I'm, I'm kind of getting old because I don't hate all cops anymore. You know, there's that guy who was bullied in high school who was like, you know, well, now I get some authority in a gun or badge and I get to take it out on other people. Well, you know, screw that guy still. But then there's the guy, you know, you ask, why did you become a cop? And he says, well, they were paying $5 an hour more than the post office and I get to carry a gun. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, I, I can relate to that guy. I, I was almost that guy. So you, you look at this division and you, you think about the way that even the George Floyd protests and riots, as, and, and, and this is just to remind everybody, deaths like George Floyd's happened on a regular basis and still are, although hopefully with this attention, perhaps less so with the police. Why did that happen now? Donald Trump walks into the trap set for him by the left, or I should say the left wing of the American Socialist Party as opposed to the right wing of the American Socialist Party known as the Republicans. And so the Democrats set this, this trap with the media, you know, and, and Trump walks right into it. He thinks, oh, I can get out of it. He's got one foot in the trap, one foot out, but then that foot outside whoop, slips on the banana peel known as George Floyd. And now we have a president with lower approval ratings than ever before. We're going to get to that later on in the show today as well. With the situation he's facing today, I look at these cops, you know, and, and Donald Trump is, is very, you know, pro law and order, which is of course, the disorder and chaos of the police state. And now it, I'm, I'm starting to feel, you know, sympathy, really, for police as a whole. Who, you know, uh, yeah, they're bastardized. Many of them deliberately acting as bastards. And yet they are victims, too. They are pawns. You know, again, victim blaming. You can take this victim blaming thing all the way and say you can't blame anybody because we're all a victim of our parents and circumstance and childhood conditioning and all of that. But this is a new level of divide, of being afraid of each other. And this is this is really one of the most dangerous underpinnings of government right don't don't call your neighbor call the police you should be afraid of, of your fellow citizens but trust your government so back to california now the federal program that offered out of work people an extra six hundred dollars a week in unemployment benefits is about to end unless a divided congress votes to re-up it the california employment development department which handles unemployment claims is overwhelmed the struggling economy has just taken another body blow and hundreds of thousands of parents will have to keep their children at home for remote learning for the foreseeable future. Hospitals aren't overwhelmed. Unemployment offices are overwhelmed. That was the curve we never should have allowed to spike in the first place, but here it is and here we are. So to this uh, federal issue of the housing eviction moratorium, that's coming to an end pretty soon here. July 24, that runs out. So as Le uh, Lesko said, I'm angry with people that refuse to protect others. They're being selfish and ignorant and they're not paying attention.
Don't tell that to Barre Freeman, a personal trainer at Built, a neighborhood gym in Manhattan Beach that shut down this weekend is struggling to stay alive. We're pissed off at Governor Newsom. He said small businesses are going to close that are never going to come back. Is this gym going to be able to survive if they have 60 days more of no revenue? Virus liked traffic zipped by on Highland Avenue. Freeman tugged at a black bandana that kept slipping down his nose. He talked about a client, a lawyer who had to take a pay cut because of the pandemic and can no longer afford training sessions. He fumed at cookie cutter responses to the coronavirus that he says punish everyone, whether they live in a particularly hard hit area or not, whether they're following federal safety guidelines or not. Now, a lot of these suicides aren't being able uh, to be properly dealt with because of hospitals being partly shut down. And I know this sounds absolutely crazy and counterintuitive, but that is one of the effects of the lockdowns because people were afraid to go to hospitals. Hey, you might you might catch corona from someone standing in line to get your corona screening. There's that. But also people were being told to stay away and hospitals actually were forced to shut down whole sections based on governor's orders saying that elective surgeries or non-essential surgeries needed to be pushed back. And a lot of those non-essential surgeries were the, the kind of, of health maintenance essential surgeries that it's like, well, you don't just push them back without consequences. You push back some of these so-called elective procedures, and next thing you know, they are actual health emergencies. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe we just need to remind ourselves of that quote from Benjamin Franklin about the Revolutionary War, right? If we don't hang together, surely we will all hang separately. And while the suicide epidemic that we're experiencing today will never get so bad as to killing all of us, more than ever, it is time to stop the victim blaming which only adds more strife, frustration, conflict, and suicidal ideations to the situation. More than ever, we need to hang together, support each other, stop the victim blaming, and identify who is really responsible for the crisis that we are experiencing today from top to bottom, and that's government.